So I think we've all been uh, on websites where we're filling out forms and then we go to submit the form and there's an error message or we hit the refresh button accidentally and suddenly our form is blank. We've lost all of our data. Uh, some websites do the user a courtesy by storing unsafe form data in some sort of a temporary storage, like something like session storage or local storage, such that the form can be repopulated with the unsaved data. And I've never actually done anything like that in a production Angular application, so I thought it would be a fun exploration in uh, Angular 9.1.9. So to set the context for this exploration, I just have a simple form here where you can enter uh, a name, a nickname, and a description of a friend. Um, so you can see if I begin to type, and down here in the console you can see that I'm flushing data to the session storage API, and I can put in some information. And what you'll see now is that if I refresh the page, that unsaved form data has been repopulated into my Angular form. And at this point I can uh, go ahead and submit it. You can see my list of friends here. And uh, if I refresh, obviously that temporary data is no longer available. So uh, let's take a look at how this is working under the hood because uh, it could be much more simple than how I've put it together, but I wanted to use this as a uh, sort of fun code kata exploration of separation of concerns and layers of abstraction. So I ended up putting things together in a way that was, was probably overly complicated, but I think more interesting. So let's take a look from the HTML layer back. So first, here is our form. You can see I have the name, nickname, description, so on and so forth. And what you'll see is I'm listening to the value changes event on my Angular form. Um, that's not a native event on the form, but we'll go into that a little later. And whenever the values change within the form, I'm calling this save to temporary storage. So the save to temporary storage is part of my app component. And uh, what you'll see is that the app component injects in its constructor this temporary storage service. And that's going to be our uh, abstraction over the session storage API so that you could theoretically have something else like the local storage API or index DB or even an Ajax call to store temporary data. Now inside my constructor I'm taking that temporary storage service and I'm just slicing out a facet of it for this particular key new friend form uh, being uh, that this now makes it a little bit easier to interact with the underlying storage. It's not necessary. I just again wanted to use this as an opportunity to sort of noodle on different uh, abstractions and APIs. So with the temporary storage, you can see now if I jump down to the uh, save to temporary storage, all we're doing is taking the existing form data and we're stuffing it into that temporary storage facet. So that's going to be essentially the value associated with this key inside of our temporary storage container. And then when the user uh, refreshes the page accidentally, just as we did, you can see here I'm restoring from the temporary storage. And if we jump to that, all that's doing is attempting to go to that temporary storage facet, grab that data, and if that data exists, push it into the form data. So that's the repopulation of the form, pulling it out, stuffing into the form data, and here is the persisting of the unsaved data. So with that, let's take a look at, at how we're implementing this temporary storage service. And again, I'll stress that uh, I'm using this as an opportunity to make things perhaps a little bit more complicated than they needed to be for such a simple demo, but I think this uh, has some interesting aspects to it. So here is my temporary storage service, and the temporary storage service exposes a very simple API. Uh, get and set are the primary data accessors. Remove, I can clear data. Um, and then here's this for key, which is what we're calling in our app component, right? When we call storage service for key, um, all that's doing is taking that key and creating an instance of this temporary storage facet, hard coding that key essentially into all subsequent interactions, and then uh, providing the selected storage option. Now, what is the selected storage option? Well, if we look at the constructor here for the temporary storage service, you can see that in the constructor, we're checking to see if window.sessionStorage exists uh, on the browser API. If it does, we're going to instantiate this session storage wrapper. And if it doesn't, we're going to instantiate this in memory wrapper. Now I'm doing this because I didn't want to have to check whether or not the session storage API exists in all of these other methods. Instead, what I wanted to do is create a wrapper around the 
session storage API such that I can then interact with it very seamlessly. And again, uh, that could also be because we're going to have versions later that don't include session storage. Maybe it's local storage, maybe it's indexed DB, maybe it's an AJAX request, so on and so forth. Um, and because we want this storage behavior, so to speak, to be swappable, I also didn't want to depend on my data accessor as being synchronous, right? The session storage API and the local storage APIs are synchronous, but things like index DB and AJAX call are not synchronous. So instead of allowing for a synchronous return, I'm allowing for a promise-based return, just to drive home that kind of future-proofing of the underlying implementation. So both the session storage wrapper and the in-memory wrapper both implement this storage wrapper API, which is, again, looks very similar to the temporary storage service itself. It has an asynchronous getter and then a synchronous set and remove. Now we can jump down to those different things. Session storage wrapper, just a very, very lightweight wrapper around the underlying session, uh, session storage API, um, except because the session storage API is synchronous and blocking, there's theoretically uh, some CPU overhead with reading to or reading from and writing to it. So instead of constantly using the session storage as the source of truth, instead I create this in-memory cache object, which is just key value pairs, and then I treat it as a write-through cache essentially. So when you read from the session storage wrapper, you're reading from the cache, and then if you write to the session storage wrapper, you're writing to both the cache and eventually the underlying session storage API. But again, because the session storage API is synchronous and blocking, uh, I'm actually going to do that with a timer and a little bit of debouncing. Right? If we jump back to the browser, you can see that as I type here, I'm not getting flooded with calls to flush that data to the session. Instead, you can see there's a one second delay between my typing and the flushing. Right? And that's because we want to uh, allow continuous typing within a form to not constantly be serializing data and flushing it to the session storage API. Um, and then you can see we load from the session storage API on construction of this class so that we only have to read from it once. Everything else is being, again, read from this internal in-memory cache. And then you can see when we go to, where is it, persist a cache, uh, I'm debouncing that outside of the Angular zone so that I'm not constantly uh, triggering change detection when I execute my timeouts. And then ultimately that just sets an item, takes care of all the serialization, and so on and so forth. So another thing that's nice about having these wrappers, if we jump back up to my temporary storage service, is that these handle all of the potential serialization and deserialization under the hood. Right? If I'm using an in-memory wrapper, which is just using an in-memory hash, uh, there is no sense of serializing and deserializing objects because they never have to be persisted to a storage mechanism. Uh, but session storage does. But I don't want, again, the calling context, this temporary storage service, which has a storage behavior, I don't want it to have to know about that. So all of those little nitty-gritty detail, nitty details are uh, pushed down into the implementation details. And then we can just take a quick look at the in-memory version, which is really just a glorified set of getters and setters around this in-memory object. Um, one nice thing about uh, being in Angular 9.1.9 is that I'm also on TypeScript 3.7, which means I can finally use this nullish coalescing operator, which is very much akin to the Elvis operator in other languages, which essentially says, look at the left-hand operand. If it returns null or undefined, then use this as the fallback. And in this case, my fallback uh, is null. And I'm just making that to, to, to make this code very explicit. And yeah, so again, um, more complicated than it has to be, but I think it's a fun exploration of the separation of concerns and the use of different objects to hide behaviors and then compose them together to create something that's, I think, both powerful but also flexible. Um, and let me actually just jump back into the HTML for a second. So I said that we're listening for this value changes event on my Angular form so that if any of these inputs here change, like if any of the ng model values change, I can react to that change by pushing that data down to the session storage API. Now, this value changes event isn't actually exposed on the ng form object that we get with our forms module. So instead, what I'm doing is actually creating a 
simple directive that reaches into this form and pipes the underlying value changes observable into this value changes event emitter. And let's just take a quick look at that. Here's my form value changes directive. You can see it's selecting on form with the attribute value changes, exposing that value changes output. And all it's doing is injecting the instance of ng form, right? That's the instance of ng form associated with the same host element then grabbing the value changes observable from this form control and then piping that into the event emitter for this directive. So essentially, uh, I'm taking this value which is not being exposed and then exposing it through this simple uh, subscribe operation. And yeah, just a fun little code kata. Again, I never uh, implemented anything like this in production, but uh, I think something like this does make sense. I've certainly been on websites that implement something like this. I don't know how they implement it under the hood, but I've certainly been in a user experience where I have form data that could have been lost, but is not lost and is instead repopulated based on some sort of uh, flash storage system. So uh, definitely, I think, a better user experience there and hopefully one that I can start to think about in my uh, Angular application development going forward.